Greetings, faithful viewer. Welcome back to Launch vs. Last, where we take a look at a system's launch titles and early titles and compare them with said library's last games. Today, we're leaping into the new and exciting frontier of 3D technology. Follow me! <laughs> System. Welcome to the chunky, clunky, polygonal realm contained within the Charcoal Beast, the Smoke Ray Smoke Show itself, the Nintendo 64. Truth be told, many games from this early 3D era today are considered muddy and archaic, but I think with some time and patience, there's a lot to learn and love about the Nintendo 64 and its legacy. Lasting from late 1996 to fizzling out quickly around early to mid-2001, the N64 truly had a pretty quick four to five years in the spotlight. And even in that short time, I'd say you can recognize quite a bit of progression in terms of what developers were able to get out of this limiting cartridge-based console. Compared to most major systems, the Nintendo 64 has a relatively small library of games. In North America, less than 300 N64 games were released, making it very feasible to keep track of and know every game here. That's why I think the N64 is the perfect system to start with for anyone who wants to gain a better understanding of video game libraries without it being too daunting. And let me tell you, it's a strange feeling to be at a social gathering knowing somewhere in that earthworm-sized brain I'm just dying for someone to ask me about Biofreaks. There's a certain fascination I have with the N64's library from its launch to its final days that I cannot get enough of. So without further ado, get in or get out, let's launch! <laughs> Pilot Wing 64 When the Nintendo 64 launched in North America in 1996, your options for games you were taking home that day were Mario 64 or two copies of Mario 64. Otherwise, you were getting Pilot Wing 64, a game I only ever see brought up as well, the other option. But let's put those snide remarks to the side for a second. How is Pilot Wings as a game and launch title? The original launched for the Super Nintendo, displaying the SNES's Mode 7 graphics that gave the illusion of 3D. But with this follow-up on the N64, finally that original vision could be realized in an authentic, juicy 1996 3D environment. Each level sees you doing different flight tests. You'll be hang gliding, flying on a chopper, there's a jetpack that's super easy to control. All the vehicles actually handle very well, surprisingly, even today. For most of the game, you'll just be soaking in that beautiful 64-bit view, making Pilot Wings a good launch title to demonstrate the N64's hardware in terms of scale and draw distance. And I'd say it holds up pretty damn well. The colors are vibrant and the character designs were all kept cartoony and simple. The challenges here may not seem like much. A lot of them have you just flying through rings or taking photos, but trust me, these are pretty hard to master and the scoring system in this game can be pretty unforgiving. Gliding through these levels, it's a really good show of just how finely tuned the N64 analog stick was. You need really good precision and timing to pull some of these off. And even then, you gotta be able to stick the landing. We're coming in too hot. Another happy landing. This whole game feels like a nice and cozy vacation. Whereas Mario 64 offered this grand sweeping 3D platforming adventure, Pilot Wings is a lot more subdued. Yeah, some of these challenges are super stressful, but it's still a relaxing game that's easy to pick up and enjoy even today. I can only imagine just how unique it must have been to play this at launch and traverse these 3D environments in such a laid back and scenic method. Perhaps Pilot Wings is worthy of sharing that spotlight with Mario 64 rather than being in its shadow. Oh yeah, and the sound design and music are absolutely fantastic. Oh yeah, nice and slow, not like that other guy. He doesn't love you like I do, he doesn't see the things I see in you. That ain't real, baby. But I'm real, baby. Yeah. Let me launch into you. I'm gonna suck on your 64 bit toes. Last, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3. Let me put things in perspective for a second here. By 2001, the N64 was pretty much on its last breath. Nintendo had already moved on to gearing up for the GameCube's launch, and I think everybody was eager to see what was next leaving a year of very few last-second releases on N64. Just to give you an idea, 
Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 released in August 2001 and was already one of the last N64 games ever released. And exactly a year later, we got Pro Skater 3. But not only is this game the last ever N64 game in its official run, it was the only N64 game that released in 2002. I'm more familiar with Pro Skater 3 on GameCube, which felt like this perfection of the gameplay formula. It feels much faster and there's more mechanics to keep your combos going, and the levels are larger, you have more things to do in them, so I was really skeptical of how they were gonna fit this all on this dusty ass cartridge. And man, it's just surreal seeing this all here on the N64. It feels like someone handed me a really good demake because surprisingly, Pro Skater 3's gameplay mechanics are all here intact. I had a goofy ass smile on my face when I landed that first revert because it instantly said everything I needed to know. At its core, the DNA of Pro Skater 3 is here in this N64 version. It's everywhere else that had to be compromised. Obviously, graphically and in presentation, but a few of the 6th gen levels were cut or reduced somewhat, but what does make it here is really fascinating to behold. Also, Bam Margera will forever be immortalized on an N64 cartridge because of this game. If only I were so lucky. The soundtrack is also compressed and heavily reduced as one would expect, but there's just something about hearing Del the Funky Homo Sapien on the same console I played Banjo-Kazooie on that's just so cool to me. But while we're at it, how about we talk about another one of N64's last games, Razor Freestyle Scooter. You see, between that year-long window of time between Tony Hawk, Pro Skater 2 and 3 that I mentioned earlier, only four Nintendo 64 games were released in America, and one of those was this. Skateboarding is out, that's old people shit, crusty ass bird man. Razor Scooter is in, let's break your kid's shins. It's a very bare bones, stiff, and sterile pro skater ripoff, just meant to quickly cash in on the game's success. It doesn't feel well to control, grinding on rails and doing combos feels very stilted, and there's really not much to do here. Your starting character is a kid named Chad. He's so cool, he's got this Razor Scooter and he falls off buildings like it's nothing. There is a few unlockable characters here too, like a buff baby version of Dito Ortiz, a robot, and a shock monkey. Also bizarrely, this game was originally only released as a blockbuster rental exclusive along with NFL Blitz Special Edition, meaning for quite a while it was only available as a rental. I guess that kind of explains the really short length of the game, but also it's worth pointing out that the NFL Blitz Special Edition is the exact same game as NFL Blitz 2001, just with an updated roster. Meaning had it not been for Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 coming out in 2002, Razor Freestyle Scooter would have been the last truly original N64 game. Thank God for you, Tony. Launch! Shadows of the Empire. Originally meant to launch alongside the N64, Shadows of the Empire didn't release until that same Christmas and was a huge multimedia project by Lucasfilm meant to appease Star Wars fans while Industrial Light and Magic was still figuring out how much computer power it would take to make a CGI frog do this. <laughs> It was supposed to be a new Star Wars adventure, one that would comfortably sit alongside the films, bridging the gaps between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. A game like this was sure to be a big draw for a new system, that's why they even got my man last name Trooper first name Storm right next to Mario on the box. In Shadows of the Empire, you play as polygonal thick boy Himbo Han Solo himself at a dash Rendar. They say in his biceps alone is the entire polygonal count of Rugrats in Paris the official movie game. With the expansion pack. I caught you, Myron. I'm Dash Rendar, baby. I'm the main character of Star Wars. Let's go. It's me. As Dash, you'll be hopping from planet to planet, mowing down stormtroopers and experiencing this Lion King one and a half type beat where you run across a few key Star Wars moments and characters. You mean to tell me when the Millennium Falcon was escaping Hoth in Episode 5, all George Lucas had to do was move the camera like three yards to the right and we would have seen Dash? Most of the levels see you on foot in pretty basic shootouts and platforming sections, and the combat is pretty simplified with a very generous auto-aim. For being one of the first 3D action games like this, you gotta commend Shadows of the Empire for where it still does hold up today. There's a lot of clunkiness involved, but once you get properly acclimated to it, there's a pretty fun Star Wars game in here, one that I feel doesn't get enough credit. The game even lets you choose to play from multiple constantly changing camera angles so you can experience the true nauseating cin cinema cinematography just like the movies. Today 
a good lot of Shadows of the Empire is summed up as, uh, oh yeah, I had that really good opening Battle of Hoth level that led to the development of Rogue Squadron, which is agreed to be a much better game, but I feel like that's always been pretty unfair and dismissive. I mean, there is some good fun to be had with the other 90% of this game that never seems to get talked about. I appreciate how many different kinds of levels and mechanics this game throws at you. Yeah, it may have been wiser if they stuck to doing a few things very well, but what they do introduce adds enough variety that it really feels like this game is a galaxy-spanning adventure. Some of the levels and boss fights are a bit of a slog, and I want to add that not everything here that's bad is a result of this game aging poorly. Like, no, this, this speeder bike section was always bought the poodoo. It does highlight how clunky many of these early N64 titles could be, even for their time, and of course, there were limitations in the presentation. All the cutscenes here are mostly static images, whereas the later PC release got CGI FMVs. Still, with these first few steps into the 3D action genre, The Shadows of the Empire was a really good start. Thank you for your services, Dash Beefwalker. Last, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. This is one of those late N64 releases that didn't get a lot of love or exposure. It's still a game that goes a little under the radar, which sucks because it truly was one of the most impressive games you could find in the system's library. Developed by Factor 5, who are known for working absolute magic on the N64 with their Rogue Squadron games, it was inevitable LucasArts would have them do the same thing here with Indiana Jones. I mean, compared to something like Shadows of the Empire, it really shows how far Factor 5 was able to push it. All the storytelling is done with in-game cutscenes and full voice acting, and the environments here look a lot cleaner and sharper, especially with the help of the expansion pack. Indy's got this lighter he carries with him that illuminates dark areas of temples and caves, and it made my jaw drop to see this done so consistently well on Nintendo 64. Seriously, I was going through these levels just popping this bad boy out like Indy was about to start spitting a Little Wayne verse. Gameplay-wise, Indy feels like a direct answer to Tomb Raider, but instead of Lara Croft and her busty bandicoots, you'll be enjoying the view of Harrison Ford's 64-bit meat cubes. There's even a good bit of influence from Ocarina of Time with how you manage your items with the C buttons and the Z targeting that comes with the combat. You'll be puzzle solving through different temples and tombs, collecting different artifacts, and mowing down Soviets and those goddamn snakes. Combat here is nothing too special, most of the time you'll want to avoid it and get back to the actual exploring and adventuring, and sometimes the AI bugs out for you and decides they ain't want no trouble. Did we just become best friends? I think so. At first, some of the platforming does feel a bit frustrating and stiff, which makes sense. You gotta remember, on N64, Factor 5 was used to developing games where you pilot an X-Wing, not ones where you control a human being bouncing around with a fedora. Of course, Indy's also got his trusty whip, but it's used sparingly and more for contextual moments. As a weapon in combat, uh, I'd say it's more useful for some light foreplay. Oh yeah, hard to talk to Jules. Oh yeah, you like that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Expression pack in hand, uh, uh, Boring conversation, anyway. Factor 5 really did a good job at matching the presentation style of the actual movies. It's remarkable what they were able to accomplish with a skeleton crew of people working on this game. And it's a real shame because not many people got to enjoy it. It's a common tragedy with a lot of these later N64 releases. Like, not only were people already moving on from the system when this game came out, but LucasArts did not make this an easy one to get a hold of. Again, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine was one of those N64 games that was exclusive to Blockbuster Video for a time. Meaning the only other way you were getting this game when it released was through LucasArts or Blockbuster.com in the year 2000. And because of this, Infernal Machine is one of the more rare N64 games out there. My copy even still has the Blockbuster sticker on it, like a cruel branding on a game that deserves so much more exposure. Something something you belong in a museum, my friend. Launch! Cruising USA. Part of a console's draw during the N64's release was how well it would be able to replicate the arcade experience. It'd be a true testament of the Ultra 64's power if it was able to really deliver an arcade game at home. That's why a good majority of the N64's launch year titles were ports of arcade games like Killer Instinct Gold or Mortal Kombat. And that's where we also get Cruising USA, an arcade racer where you cruise across the good old US of A. Hi, I'm Ted Balabanis. I'd like to introduce you to Williams Valley Midway's first motion game, Cruising USA. Today I don't go on vacations to have fun, I go on vacations to say, yo, that's the place from Cruising USA! Cruising was crucified by the critics when it came out because a lot cited that it was too little too late. 
The original arcade game was already a few years old by late 1996, and by those standards, it was considered a little outdated even for its time. It especially wasn't a good look that the frame rate was pretty choppy and nauseating in places. But look, I don't care that trees fall down like they're made out of paper, and I don't care that each race looks like I'm just scrolling real fast to Google Maps Street View. This game is still a ton of fun. People can talk about how unrealistic and silly the graphics here are all day, but yo, driving like an asshole in LA, there's nothing more realistic than that. Every race here is either a laid-back drive-out in the country or a chaotic derby of wacky arcade goodness. Every time you crash, the cars and objects go flying, the driving here is super simple enough to pick up. There's even little details I noticed today, like when I was driving in first-person view and this little fly splattered onto the windshield and freaked me the hell out. Hey, Junko. <laughs> I can see why at launch a game like Cruising USA would be considered disappointing and overpriced, but for what it's worth today, decades removed from all the hype, I think it is a very nice addition to any N64 collection. It's a nice game to sit back and relax and just enjoy for an hour or so. It's a joyous, relatively smooth 64-bit cross-country trip with some bumps along the way, especially if you bring a buddy. The two-player mode here is a blast, just ramming into each other and causing a bunch of chaos on the road, I definitely recommend it. Sometimes, in real life even, I'll just drive endlessly, hoping I'll eventually begin to make out all my good friends waiting for me off in the horizon. All my hot babes will be there cheering me on, Beefcake Boy will be there. No, that's really his name, they said so in the credits. And I'll finally be handed my trophy for all my years of work. But alas, they're all trapped in this little cartridge. I'll be with you one day, my sweet. Last, Mega Man 64. Mega Man 64 is a port that not a lot of many people are aware even exists. It came out late in the N64's life, and especially since Capcom mostly moved on to the PlayStation during this era, it's this surprising anomaly in the N64's library. Before this, the only Capcom games we got on the 64 was the miraculous port of Resident Evil 2 and Magical Tetris Challenge starring Mickey Mouse. So at least we got some Mega Man on the way out. Thank God Grandpa yeah, yeah. Kick the Can Simulator 64 is finally here! For those unaware, this is a port of Mega Man Legends, a PS1 game that came out all the way back in 1997. Mega Man! Join him on his ultimate quest in 3D! Who are his friends? Who are his enemies? Danger ducks around every corner! with voice acting, in-game cutscenes, and a full 3D open world to traverse. A lot of this stuff is commonplace today, and it might be a little cheesy to look at now, but trust me, what they accomplished here was pretty remarkable. On the PS1, of course, so having a port like Mega Man 64 takes so long, it highlights what a huge gap in possibility there was between the PS1 and the N64. Games like Mega Man Legends were always feasible on the PlayStation, but here on N64, something like this was a huge undertaking that required clever compression techniques, thorough insight in the hardware, this wasn't something Capcom could have realistically accomplished in 1997. So we got Mega Man 64 in 2001, when a lot of people were already moving on to the PS2 or Dreamcast, or had played Mega Man Legends years ago. In fact, by the time this port came out, the sequel, Legends 2, had already been out on the PS1 for over a year. To its credit though, this game is pretty much intact here, with some very minor quality of life improvements to the controls. If you're familiar enough with N64's limits, this game really is pretty mind-blowing. Absolutely adore the presentation here. You got this nice anime style to the design of all the characters and animations, and it's held up extremely well visually. Just look at this monkey. Look how cute. Honestly, there's not much else like it you can find on the Nintendo 64, but it came at a cost. A lot of the audio and voice acting is by necessity super compressed, but they did manage to make every little lovable cheesy scene fit here. I don't understand. Whenever I think about him, I get this funny feeling. Here you have this huge sprawling island as an open world with so many different characters and individuals. I remember walking into this little strip mall area and couldn't help but see the seeds of what would eventually become something like Capcom's Dead Rising. But after this little section, the game opens up even more. And sure, it's a pretty simple boxing environment, but it still feels rich with character and charm. There's this really early section of the game where you're defending the city from tanks and robots, and once you're done with this boss fight, all the leveled houses and damage persists immediately after. And every time you revisit it, you're just left to look at the destruction that you weren't able to prevent. They already got construction workers talking about how much of an effort it's gonna be to get things back to normal. Stuff like this really goes a long way to making this world feel tangible. That's why I had more of a connection to these parts of the game, where you're traveling, exploring and talking to new characters, there's so many little details to love for this world. Before you had minions, you had these little evil yellow boogers. Oh no! I love how these little nuggets will pop out and flee after you blow up their tanks. I 
Ironically, it's when we get to these combat sections where the game would really feel archaic and a little monotonous. These caves and caverns are all so claustrophobic and kind of ugly. It really sticks out with how well made the rest of the game is, and it shows how they really struggled here to get a lot of the 2D Mega Man design translated to 3D. For a lot of franchises around this time, 2D to 3D was a huge, awkward challenge. How do you retain the spirit of a series gameplay and throw it in this brand new frontier with a whole Z-axis now involved? Well, they kind of translate the spirit of those games here in certain bursts. You're still looking for openings and experimenting with different weaponry, but moving around these 3D environments feels super clunky. Most of the time, the most optimal thing to do is just to run around enemies in a circle till they're dead. It also doesn't help that you can lock onto enemies, but you can't move, so you can't dodge any projectiles in time. It's always a risk. It makes sections where there's moving targets in the air super frustrating because you can't move along with them. I'd like to point to another N64 game called Jet Force Gemini, which much better understood how to pull off this new 3D third-person shooter gameplay. You had movement that felt snappy with graceful strafing and a target system where you could make precise shots at different body parts. Rareware here knew for an action game like this with so many different enemy types on screen you had to be able to defend yourself and move while attacking. Combat-wise, this game makes a better Mega Man 64 than the actual one. It's kind of a wasted opportunity that it took four years to make this port and they didn't include anything to really smooth out the combat. And sure, Mega Man 64 may be the weakest port of this game, there's really not much reason to play it this way now, but it's still admirable how Capcom was able to make a game on this technical scale work of the N64. It's just a shame it took so long. Hey, look at the clock! It's almost time for my favorite show! I almost missed it! <laughs> Launch to rock, Dinosaur Hunter. As a kid, one of the more memorable games I had on the N64 was Turok 2, Seeds of Evil. It came in this black cartridge and scared the bejesus out of me. It was this dark, brooding, and violent shooter, and graphically, it was one of the most impressive games we had on the system. Heck, my memories of this game have it looking more like Doom 3 than anything else. But for many years, I was always left wondering what Turok 1 was like. It was really hard to just imagine what preceded this strange sci-fi shooter game that started out with this blue lady talking to you about saving a bunch of crying children in cages. Well, Turok 1 carries a lot of that same attitude, but as a game it's much more vibrant and straightforward with its gushy bloody action and pacing. Dropped in a world of mad draw distance fog, you play as the warrior known as Turok. I am Turok! As you collect these juicy, spicy ranch Doritos trying to figure out just where you're supposed to go in this game. Give me some answers, monkey! Turok was one of those pretty hyped releases that was originally meant to be a part of the launch lineup for the N64. Being one of those earliest announced titles, there was a lot riding on this game. <laughs> In the visuals department, it was meant to be this console shooter beast supposedly only capable on the new Nintendo 64 with giant levels and motion capture technology, and when you consider the FPS genre was not really something that had yet transferred too smoothly to consoles at that point, there was a lot to live up to. But the game ended up getting delayed into 1997. When it did finally come out, it was almost immediately apparent that compromises had to be made. There's a lot of draw distance fog here. It's one of the most notorious things about Turok 1, and it's a shame because behind this murky polygonal blanket are seeds of a pretty damn good shooter. One that's just trading blows with the limitations of the N64. And for one, the levels are all pretty big, and you have to explore them in order to find these keys to unlock new levels. This could be a decent concept, you know, explore and roam this brand new 3D jungle while shooting dinos, but because of all the fog, it's really hard to want to explore any of these environments more than you have to. There was a few times it was just easier to keep the map plastered on screen while slaughtering as many dudes as I could. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next gen experience. That being said, I do think there are areas where Turok does deserve some credit. For one, I do really like the actual gunplay here. The shotgun is super satisfying to me, and watching blood spill out of the wrappers feels so over the top, it's like watching packets of gushers burst. Acclaim Entertainment also used motion capture for a lot of the enemy animations, and sure, the actual AI is pretty simple, but I love how exaggerated they are when they zigzag towards you. It's one of the few times the draw distance fog actually does add something to the experience a bit. The control scheme here is also pretty polarizing. You move using the C button on the 64 controller to replicate the experience of using a keyboard while the analog stick aims. By the time GoldenEye 007 came out a few months later boasting a much more accessible control scheme and level design, and with its multiplayer mode of course, even after all the hype generated, Turok quickly became considered more obsolete than anything. And when you consider even for its time these shortcomings were pretty apparent, it's not surprising age has not been kind to it. And while its environments and the level design are kind of a pain to deal with, I really do like the combat and atmosphere here. Just not enough to stomach this game on the N64. 
last, Aiden Chronicles, the first mage. As the limitations of the N64 and its cartridge-based games became more apparent, more and more titles found their way onto the hip new PlayStation. With its install base rapidly growing, it was cheaper to produce for and was capable of housing games with higher production value like voice acting, pre-rendered cutscenes, and bigger games with larger worlds and many characters, namely RPGs. You can't really fit all this on a cartridge, we all know this by now. Any RPG on Nintendo 64 and its already small library of games was a huge anomaly. First, you had the infamous Quest 64, one of the most aesthetically generic RPG games released and considered a major disappointment, especially when compared to something like Final Fantasy VII the year prior. Later in then 64's life, you had games like Ogre Battle 64 that proved with the understanding of the system's limitations and competent developers, of course a great RPG game was possible here. And then finally, we got Paper Mario in 2001. Not only is this game amazing, but it's a true testament to how well Nintendo knew how to work around the N64's limits by the end of its life. That 2D paper style, the humor, the charming presentation, it makes Paper Mario this really delightful experience, one that's practically timeless. No muddy environments or textures, everything just looks crisp and right. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh god, where are we? What in Glover's name am I looking at? I'm scared. And that's where we get to Aiden Chronicles, the first mage. An RPG game released just a month after Paper Mario and one of the last N64 games we got. To put it plainly, this is Paper Mario Antimatter. The environments and character models here are but ugly swamp ass. Everything is so dark and muddy. Even from the opening cutscene, it's just a bizarre game to look at. You'll be fighting big rats, bats, and fat thick ogre mamas with a pretty straightforward battle system. And look, I can handle my turn-based RPGs, but I found myself just rough through the gameplay here. Even with a skip button, it just feels so sluggish and slow. I honestly would have preferred something more traditionally turn-based than having to slowly maneuver and position every party member each turn. There's just little to no personality in this game. It's very mute. Literally, there are entire scenes with no sound effects or music. You're just watching these 64-bit marionettes bob back and forth with each other in this deafening silence. And I think what frustrates me about this game beyond its clunkiness is there's absolutely no denying that this was made with a lot of passion. You don't just decide to release a 60-hour RPG on a cartridge-based console during its final months just to make a quick buck. No. Somewhere along the way, something went wrong. Apparently, over the years, even through its flaws, Aiden Chronicles does have its share of fans that even after decades are still discovering these esoteric details about the game. I reached out to one Reddit user Shellshocker17, a big fan of the game that gave me a ton of insight about Aiden Chronicles' tumultuous but passion-driven development. According to their info in old IGN interviews, publisher THQ and development studio H2O Entertainment figured their new game could stand out in the N64's library, playing to the advantage of being one of the few RPGs for the system. Thus, they announced Nomen Quest, an RPG RPG that would comparatively be more realistic and less cartoonish in design than Quest 64. With H2O Entertainment boasting this new game's extensive lore and writing and claiming they were able to adapt their character concepts and designs into 3D with little compromise. But inevitably, with how large an undertaking this game was, it ended up suffering from numerous delays and glitches, missing a release window of 1999 to finally coming out in 2001 under the name Aiden Chronicles The First Mage. Again, in the actual game, the passion H2O had intrinsically shows. These environments are huge, complete with towns and this big labyrinth of a castle, and while at a glance it's impressive, everything feels so bland and too sluggish to stomach through. It's not like Mega Man 64 where I want to actually explore this village and talk to these characters. A lot of the gameplay feels obtuse too, like just doing something as simple as recruiting your party members in the beginning of the game, you have to choose the right path of dialogue, but it all feels so unnecessary. Like, it's just a big guessing game of choosing the right option with no real actual flow to the conversation here. Really, I doubt many people in 2001 gave this game much of a chance with how slow everything is. Again, this is a large, vast game, and there's probably more to it than most people are willing to stomach, myself included. In terms of full RPG N64 games released in the West, all your other options can pretty much be held up on the three prongs of the N64 controller itself. And let's just say you could probably do better than choosing Aiden Chronicles. And now for our final launch. Okay, let's be honest. Most of you probably saw this one coming a mile away. Psycho Habushogi. No, faithful viewer, you're not looking at one of the mini-games from Yakuza. No, this is Saikyo Habushogi, 
a launch title for the N64 in Japan along with Pilot Wings. Basically a virtual board game version of Shogi, also known as Japanese chess. <sighs> Pardon me, I just lost my train of thought for a moment. Uh, this was a Japanese region exclusive uh, with Yoshi Haruhabu, a prominent Shogi player featured on the game's cover art. Mario. What, what is it, what, 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 oh! Oh, oh, you want me to talk about Mario, don't you? Well, here's the thing. I don't crack. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, I'm tired of people acting like this game's aged poorly, all right? Because hey, it hasn't. Oh, boo-hoo, the camera controls are so bad, sometimes I have to adjust the camera a little bit. It makes these little noises. Zooey. In all seriousness, I think Mario 64 has gotten a bit of an unfair rap in recent years, especially with the release of 3D All-Stars and the Switch. A lot of people think this game hasn't aged well, Mario's movement's too clunky, it's too hard or archaic, and really, I feel kind of bad for these people. Straight up, I just don't see what they see. To me, Mario's movement in this game is like this benchmark. It's so fluid and natural, the way he controls and interacts with the environment with ease. Gracefully speeding and long jumping through these levels and platforms comes so naturally. And as for the camera, sincerely, I can only think of a couple of instances in this entire game where I had an issue with the camera's placement and found making adjustments didn't help much. Other than that, I think this game gives you everything you need and more to navigate through its levels like a breeze. I think part of it also comes from the fact that the N64 controller itself was pretty much tailor-made specifically for this game. If you're playing with a GameCube controller or Joy-Cons or a Wiimote or anything else, it's definitely fine and doable, but there's a subtle precision with the N64 controller and its button placement that just works best for this game. What's truly amazing about Mario 64 even 25 years later is how much fun it is to just revisit and wander aimlessly through these levels. To this day, I just love popping in this game and going straight to surfing on the Koopa shells. It always brings a smile to my face. And you bet Toad's little ass I don't care who I have to hurt to get here. I love this opening section of ASMR Overload of just soaking in Mario's movements, the gnat sounds. Even if you didn't grow up with this game, it just has this way of seeping into your serotonin, making you feel like you're seeing some long lost vision quest from your past life as a stout plumber looking to get peachy pog cake. You look at movement in other 3D games around or even after Mario 64's release and all those baby steps of clunkiness just feel less excusable with Mario just running laps around them like they're nothing. That's not to say this game is without its issues, far from it. A lot of these first couple of levels are instantly memorable and a blast to play through and then halfway through the game Mario 64 just kind of runs out of biomes. And you get to these pretty forgettable worlds that aren't bad or anything, they just feel serviceable and like the vibrance and character that are jam packed in the first half of the game. The power-ups in this game are also just okay. The wing cap obviously is the main attraction, allowing you to soar to the skies and enjoy these levels from a brand new perspective that organically meshes with Mario's moveset. The way you can just triple jump into flight, it feels like a reward. The other two power-ups just feel like they're meant for these very particular sections, and they don't have much use outside of that. It's not bad at all, it works within the context of the game, but with how seamlessly well put together the majority of Mario 64's gameplay is, they feel a tad out of place. They lack the freedom of experimentation and practical use that the rest of Mario's moveset offers, and for that, they don't feel as exciting. As a whole, you already know this, Mario 64 justified the N64 right off the gate, providing an experience you couldn't get anywhere else. It immediately set the bar extremely high for its library of games, and once Ocarina of Time came out, well, with this duo, you're now watching the throne. With a launch title like Mario 64, it seemed like just anything could happen in this strange, new, vibrant 3D realm. If you could do all this in Mario 64, then just what were the N64's limits, and what kind of characters and worlds were waiting to come to life within that seemingly endless amount of possible- Bouncing on flower titties. Bouncing on flower titties. Hi, you've reached, like, Barry's place. I'm not available to answer the phone, obviously. However, if you leave your, like, name and number and you sound cute, I may bring you back. Ciao! Blast. 
Conquer's bad fur day. You know that I know that you know that I had to do it. I had to. I had to include this game. One of the last major N64 titles ever released and what an absolute high note. This game acts as the perfect swan song for the N64's library. Its mere existence is just in defiance of all the system's supposed shortcomings. I mean, to launch the N64 with a game like Mario, a game that's bright, cheerful, and simple, and to close out with Conquer's Bad Fur Day, a game that twists all those elements on their head to deliver something creative and crass and unlike anything else on the system, well, it paints this perfect picture. Having this M-rated 3D platformer with its deceptively cutesy exterior was part of the humor and allure of Bad Fur Day. Most of you probably already know the history behind this game and how it started out as this kid-friendly platformer until morphing into what it is today. And it's that shock value, just being incredulous at every foul-mouthed, shit-infested, blood-splattering moment on a Nintendo console, no less, made Conquer this game that had to be seen to be believed. It's, basic, it's basically the N64's rendition of South Park. Well, this is awkward. A lot of the conversation about Conker's Bad Fur Day has kind of become a lot about these moments. It's one thing to go from N64 games struggling to have voice acting in any capacity, to have an entire musical number sung by a great mighty poo. I am the great mighty Damn it, I just lost to make a video discussing Conker's Bad Fur Day without mentioning the great mighty poo challenge. You don't you ever do that! Again, to me. On a technical level, this is Rareware at the top of their game here, employing every technique and trick they learned over the generation to deliver all these hilariously goofy scenes. What are you doing? <laughs> you stupid bastard! <laughs> <laughs> it's this entire 64-bit production of, of cartoonish violence and movie parodies. I mean, the game opens up with a Clockwork Orange parody, you got Terminator, Alien, Saving Private Ryan's Normandy scene. And keep in mind, that, that was a newer movie. It's not like today where SNL will come out with like a Squid Game music video the same week the show comes out. Parodies and satires were infrequent and special. It took years to finally get to that punchline. To have scenes like this in an N64 game was unbelievable and unique on so many levels. You even got this infamous playable parody of the Matrix lobby scene, back when the Matrix was just barely coming up on being two years old. Thanks to Conquer, you have bullet time gameplay in an N64 title, months before Max Payne would be out. It's a simple shootout section, but I absolutely love it. The same way I go Koopa surfing in Mario 64, I come to this level to eviscerate a bunch of weasels. I get that today, a lot of Conquer's eccentricities and humor just doesn't have the same impact today as it once did. I get that, I mean we're more than accustomed to this kind of stuff by now. Things like meta humor and that bait and switch type shock value aren't exactly fresh anymore 20 years later, but if you really place yourself in the time that this game came out and just appreciate it as this absolutely wild anomaly and technical achievement, I think there's still a whole lot to love about Bad Fur Day. Everything just comes together, especially by the end of this game, to tell this almost haunting and somber tale. The pacing of this game's story always reminded me of The Big Lebowski, maybe maybe because I also discovered both around the same time. Am I alone in this? They're both about a lovable schmuck getting spiraled into an absolute shit show of bad circumstance, all because of some trivial, minute detail. The dude gets involved in a drug plot, all because he just happens to share his name with the same guy this gang is after, and he just wants his rug back. Meanwhile, in Bad Fur Day, the Panther King wants to capture Conker so he can use him to prop up this lopsided table for his glass of milk. As a whole, Conker's Bad Fur Day is pretty much the embodiment of the phrase better than the sum of its parts. In a vacuum, many of these random sections of the game are just silly gameplay sequences, some of which can be clunky to control or frustrating because the game is constantly throwing new ideas at you. Sure, you do have your traditional platforming sections here and there, but nearly every chapter of this game is completely unlike the last. When it's fun or hilarious, this variety works great, and when it's not fun, it's miserable, because half the time you're basically learning a new mechanic that's only coming into play once in the entire game. Parts like this where you're controlling Conquer as a bat or trying to roll this barrel down this narrow winding path will forever be some of the game's weakest and most infuriating parts and oh my god I actually did it first time on this playthrough I am a god! With stuff like this I'm never surprised when someone says they don't like this game I totally get where they're coming from. But for the most part I'd say this grab bag of concepts mostly plays to Conquer's strength. 
You see, when you familiarize yourself and played enough of the N64's library of games, at first, it seems very clear and cut out what the console's limitations are. So it makes finding what games really do stick out and manage to work past these limits feel much more special and impressive. Even the simplest of worlds that the N64's library was able to cook up seemed that much more surreal. Like there was a clear thread that visually conjoined every single one of the system's games. There was this almost tangible and consistent low poly Lord of the Rings mud that all N64 games came from for better or worse. And while I can marvel all day about Conker's technical achievements on the system, I think really what made Bad Fur Day so special is how the limitations of the N64 shaped such a creative and unique game. Conker didn't just defy those limits, but from them it made something unforgettable and unlike almost any other game from that console era. I can't help but adore it, flaws and all, as this end result, the celebration of everything the N64 accomplished. So when I pop in Mario 64 and I first start running around the outside areas of Peach's castle, really soaking in the sounds and visuals, somewhere between those razor thin cracks of each texture and polygon, I can't help but recognize what eventually will become a great mighty poop, and one that I can't forget.